everyone. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman, and welcome to What Women Must Know. Thank you for joining me once again for these really important and powerful conversations that are designed to support you in actually having a greater knowledge, really stepping into a level of power within yourself so you can make the best and most informed decisions regarding your health and well-being. If you are listening for the very first time, or maybe if you've just been a regular listener but have not yet either liked me on my Facebook page, What Women Must Know, so you can get the archive shows every week, or the other option is to just go to my website, which is Dr. Cheryl Selman, that's D-R, CherylSelman.com, and opt in there, and then I can send you these wonderful shows every week right to your inbox. And by the way, I have a second program on Progressive Radio Network called The Love Code, and that is more of a spiritual orientation, and it's very inspiring and uplifting, and if you um, like me over on my Facebook page, What Women Must Know, or go to that website, Dr. Cheryl Selman. Both of these shows will be sent to you. And, of course, I have lots of other great information and programs and things that I'm learning all the time. So hope you'll join me there and uh, stay tuned to everything that's going on. So I want to jump into my guest today because I'm really excited to be able to have with me all the way from the UK, Dr. Michael Mosley, and he is an international number one best-selling author of the book, The Fast Diet. We've had Michael on the show in the past, and I just want to share a little bit about my guest today, and then we'll jump into our conversation and his latest book. So uh, Dr. Michael Mosley is the author of The Clever Gut Diet, The Eight-Week Blood Sugar Diet, and the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, The Fast Diet. He is also co-author of Fast Exercise. Dr. Mosley trained to be a doctor at the Royal Free Hospital in London before joining the BBC, where he has been a science science journalist, executive producer, and more recently a well-known TV personality. He has won numerous TV awards and was named Medical Journalist of the Year by the British Medical Association. His latest book is The Fast 800 Diet, Discover the Ideal Fasting Formula to Shed Pounds, Fight Disease, and Boost Your Overall Health. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Mosley to the show today. So hello and welcome, Michael. Pleasure to be back again. Yes, I was saying to you before we jumped onto the show, this is the third time I, uh, following your progress and your ongoing research to a problem that is really huge. And we're talking about obesity, uh, being overweight, but it actually has turned into the obesity epidemic. And I want you to know that I live in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is third from the bottom on obesity. 38% of the population is obese. And uh, I just looked up these statistics, by the way, which you probably know about. But according to the recent uh, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data, adult, this is 2019, as of September 2019, adult obesity rates now exceed 35% in nine states, 30% in 31 states, and 25% in 48 states. And this is a pattern not just in the U.S., it's going on in Australia, where I spend so much of my time. It's going on, obviously, in the U.K. as well. Wow, you know, this. when you think about what has happened to the populations in just, I would say, 20 years, it, it's horrifying, actually, what we have done, what has happened to us. So Absolutely. we're going to talk about that problem and, and what you've been researching. So. So can we just start by what are your thoughts that that is that is dri- that is driving this ob- it's not just an overweight issue now it's an obesity epidemic now it is and for the first time in human history more people are dying because of um, diseases and complications of obesity and being overweight than from starvation and we all know obesity is bad and being overweight is bad But people forget that it drives things like type 2 diabetes, breast cancer, dementia. Pretty well all the bad chronic diseases are driven in turn uh, by having too much fat. And that's really why I'm passionate about it. I'm not so bothered about what people look like, but more about what it's doing to their underlying health. 
And I do think it's taken off around the world. So it kind of kicked off in 1980, pretty much. The U.S. has led the way, but lots of other countries, as you were citing, are already at risk of overtaking the U.S. Like you, I spent a lot of time in Australia. Now, I think the fifth uh, fattest country on Earth. U.K., we're up there as well. We're certainly the fattest country in Europe. China, the obesity rates have absolutely flown through the roof. You always have a sort of caricature of the Chinese as being quite slim, uh, not any longer. And I think one of the major drivers has obviously been the rise and rise of junk food, convenience food, processed food, ultra-processed food. The fact that um, we now feed ourselves and our children with these foods. So I don't know what the statistics are in Oklahoma, but I imagine in the States, generally, something like 80% of the food that people eat is what they call ultra-processed. It's not stuff that your granny or your grandfather would ever recognize. So I think that has been the major driver above everything else. It has been the fact that we consume so many of these really quite unnatural foods, which our bodies just aren't used to eating. Well, they're really synthetic foods. I mean, food is using the term very loosely, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Absolutely. When you look at the ingredients, you realize they, uh, you know, they borrow from the chemical industry. The, most of these things have enormously long names. Um, and they're actually uh, derivatives of the petrochemical. They come from coal. They come from oil originally, uh, not from some sort of happy-looking cow. Um, so they put nice pictures on, uh, you know, on these products. But when you realize they're actually sort of mass-produced in factories and they have been engineered to be profoundly addictive. And that's one of the themes of my new book, The Fast 800, kind of looking at what are the most addictive foods on the planet and how you can counteract their malign influence. Because people kind of think, you know, I'm overweight, I'm obese, it's all my fault. I don't believe that. I do believe that we live in this environment where it is very difficult uh, to exercise, but it is even more difficult to resist the lure of um, these sort of foods. And um, that's kind of why I write about the books, why I talk about them, because I do passionately believe that if people kind of know what's going on, um, and if you can give them detailed advice on the best ways to uh, maintain their health, then people will respond. And indeed, we're beginning to get, I think, you know, in the States, obesity rates are beginning to peak. In the UK, they're beginning to peak. I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic than I was when I started out on this particular journey seven or eight years ago. Well, I'm sure you ha you have had a lot to do with it, and and I, I want to get into your new book. I, before I go there, just a couple of more things about staying on the subject of what's generating obesity. Um, we we talk about the uh, imitation foods, <laughs> um, uh, which is uh, why it's so important to eat organic. Um, and then there's all the chemicals, pesticides, and glyphosates that have had a huge impact on altering our biochemistry. Do you have any thoughts about that? No, absolutely. And beyond that, they've had a huge impact on altering our microbiome. Um, the book I wrote, Clever Guts, was really all about your gut bacteria, your microbiome. And this is something people weren't talking about two or three years ago. Now there are just huge numbers of research projects on it. People kind of know about probiotics and prebiotics. But we have just begun to appreciate the role that this inner world plays in our overall health. So these are the microbes. There are probably 100 trillion down there. Uh, there's around two to three pounds of them. There are as many bacterial and viral cells down in your gut as there are human cells in your entire body. So we are 50% bacteria, 50% human. And unfortunately, a lot of the ingredients you get in these artificial foods, they're not only bad for us, but they are bad for our microbiome. And they are inflammatory. And inflammation is one of the primary drivers of anxiety, depression, dementia, and cancer. So um, you're not just, you know, when you're eating some of these foods, you're not just kind of whacking yourself. You're also whacking this precious group of bacteria. Uh, and that seems to be one of the main mechanisms by which all the bad stuff happens. It's such a complicated web because there's so many pieces of our culture now that's driving this dysfunction that leads to putting on weight, in including, of course, stress, yes. which is something I've looked into. That's a, a major driver of altering all of hormonal signaling and generating inflammation and brain dysfunction and everything else. And and the other thing, I, I don't know whether you've looked into, but I, I have, and that's the effect of EMFs in our Wi-Fi world and how 
they actually are altering our cell signaling. Okay, that's not something I have looked at. Um, no, my focus has been very much um, on kind of food and artificial foods and things like that. And as I said, microbiome, I'm not aware of that research. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, there's just, you know, we just live in this 21st century that is such a challenge because of what we have been conditioned to be doing in eating and what our choices are that uh, unless you really work at it to choose an organic diet it's 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 a challenge if you are out there in the world so Mm -hmm. let's 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 move over to the newest research that you have in your new book the fast 800 diet you've been on this trail for many years now trying to help us and uh, reveal to us and guide us into the best strategies based on the research you have put together and investigated how to get healthy and particularly how to generate a healthy body and uh, get our get our uh, optimal weight back on track. So, so what you've done so much work on this. What has kept you on the trail that led to this book? Sure. So it all started back in 2012, so that would be almost exactly eight years ago, uh, when I discovered that I had type 2 diabetes. And my dad had developed type 2 diabetes at around the same age I was then, which was 55. And he kind of followed the medical advice, which was to start on medication and uh, go on a low-fat diet. Anyway, it didn't do any good. Uh, His diabetes progressed. He started to inject insulin. And then he died at the age of 72 from complications of type 2 diabetes, including dementia and heart disease. So um, I didn't want to go down that road. So I was, it was a nasty shock discovering I had type 2 diabetes. I wasn't that significantly overweight, but I had quite a, you know, a bit of a belly, a bit of a tummy. Uh, my waist was around 36 inches. She wasn't huge. Uh, but that's when I started looking. I went to see my doctor. She said, we've got to start your medication. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to find something else. And that led me to making a film for the BBC called Eat Fast, Live Longer. Went over to the States where I came across some really interesting research into something called intermittent fasting. Now, at the time, nobody was talking about intermittent fasting, but there was a researcher at the National Institutes on Aging called uh, Professor Mark Matson, Dr. Mark Matson, And he had spent 20 years doing research primarily in animals. And he said, look, if you change the way you eat, the pattern within which you eat, then I think there's a very good chance that you will be able to get rid of your diabetes and you will also improve other factors. This is kind of what they had found in animals. So with his guidance, I created something which I called the 5-2 diet. And the idea there was you just kind of cut your calories down a couple of days a week down to around six or 700 calories and you ate healthily on the other days. And uh, when I did that, I lost about 20 pounds in about eight or nine weeks without too much effort, and my diabetes went away. So I was thrilled by that. The program went out. I wrote a book about it. It became a worldwide phenomenon. And indeed, lots of people did it. Jimmy Kimmel did it. He lost something like 40 pounds. And he said the reason he'd done it is because he'd seen me on the telly, uh, on the TV, and he'd been so impressed, he decided to do it himself. So it also turned intermittent fasting into a massive worldwide thing. So that if you look at Google searches, nobody's interested in intermittent fasting until the book and the film come out. And then, whoa, it's um, one of the number one trends now. And I can obviously talk about intermittent fasting in different forms and the reasons why it might be beneficial. But as I said, that was the beginning of my journey. And uh, I was obviously deeply thrilled that I'd managed to get rid of my type 2 diabetes and I wanted to go and spread the message. And so I began to write more books, make more programs, and uh, did research with a number of universities in the UK um, in looking at you know, intermittent fasting, type 2 diabetes, inflammation, really, and doing an awful lot of public speaking as well. So that's kind of where I began eight years ago. And it has been unbelievably exciting following the research as it has developed because it's really taking off now in unexpected directions and there are so many people who have um, got benefit from it. So I just wanted to ask, so when when you began, 
searching for healing for your diabetes and then you found the intermittent fasting, what was it that you were doing that was generating diabetes before you started intermittent fasting? Because I would imagine you were quite educated and aware and trying to do the right thing. But what was the missing piece that was driving your diabetes diagnosis? Yeah, um, the main reason turned out to be that I thought I was eating a sort of healthy diet, but I was allowing myself rather too many snacks, I think. And my weight had gradually crept up and up. Um, So I had, um, you know, over the years, I used to be pretty skinny uh, when I was in my 20s and 30s, and then I gradually put on more and more weight. And it was that. It was the gut fat. It was the fat that I had put on a lot more weight, particularly around my waist, uh, which seemed to be the key. Because as I later discovered, when I met a guy uh, at a university, a guy who was a professor of diabetes research called Roy Taylor, he had demonstrated, and indeed his research is so impressive, that the UK government have just announced they're going to be doing a massive study on diabetes reversal. I'll come to that later. But anyway, he said to me, the main reason I developed diabetes, and this is true of the vast majority of people, is that when you put on this weight around your waist, then what happens is a lot of the fat uh, can no longer be stored in the fat cells and it sort of seeps out into your liver and your pancreas. And these two organs are responsible for controlling your blood sugar levels. And when they get saturated with fat, then what happens, they stop talking to each other and they stop responding and you start to develop what's called insulin resistance and ultimately type 2 diabetes. So it was all about the, the visceral fat, the gut fat, infiltrating the liver and the pancreas. And indeed, uh, what Roy Taylor said to me when I first met him was that uh, to reverse type 2 diabetes uh, in the vast majority of people, all you need to do is lose less than one ounce of fat from your pancreas. But to do that, you're going to lose, have to lose about 10% of your body weight. And he has overwhelming evidence now, this is true, from huge randomized controlled trials, so much so it is going to change the face of medicine in this area. I'm convinced that this is a massive, massive, uh, you know, revolution in our thinking about diabetes, that in future people are not just going to be whacked on drugs and told, you know, uh, good luck, that we are actually going to find ways to help people lose weight. And he's just done a big, big trial um, showing the, the vast majority of people, as I said, if you can get them to lose weight to a rapid weight loss diet, uh, then in the majority of cases they're able to come off their medication and live happy, healthy lives. That's so exciting, really, to find these keys that actually are drugless, right? They're drugless. We can just we can just make the right choices, behavioral changes. We can reverse these terrible conditions. Absolutely. I've had what people need is die. hope. They need yeah. hope. They need to know that this is possible. They need to know there's good, solid science behind it. Nobody's kind of making stuff up. They need illustrations, examples from other people who've done it. And when that happens, uh, I am firmly convinced that people will go right. Uh, you know, not everyone's going to want to do it, but certainly the vast majority of people who have been involved in these trials. And I've been running an online program now. Uh, it, I can talk more about that. But so far, 20,000 people have done it, and on average, they have lost 20 pounds. And around 75% of those who were originally type 2 diabetic are off all medication now. So it really, really does work. Uh, you obviously have to work at it. Uh, but the great thing is, you know, if you're motivated to change, uh, then you really can. And my wife, who's a doctor, she sees a lot of diabetic patients, and she's had spectacular success with getting them off medication. And as I said, uh, the old message used to be, give up hope, take this, start on metformin, uh, the disease will progress, you'll probably be on insulin, and you're going to die 10 years earlier than you might otherwise do from dementia and all sorts of other things. That was the all you could tell patients. Now we can say, no, you can actually reverse it. You can stop in its tracks. Uh, you can get your pancreas moving again. And I think that's a wonderful message of hope. Absolutely. And, you know, I, people don't understand that when you're putting on this visceral fat, it's not just showing up in your gut, but it's being the fat is being laid down in all these internal organs. So we are really having a huge impact and compromising 
the functioning of these critical organs in our body. We can't see it, so we don't really appreciate just how much damage is going on when you fill your organs with fat. Absolutely. And one of the other things we know, for example, is that uh, liver failure caused by too much fat in your liver, uh, that is now the number one cause of liver failure in the U.S. It's replaced alcohol. It used to be alcohol which damaged your liver. Now it's fat. It is the number one reason why Americans have liver transplants or go into liver failure. It's because too much fat in the liver. And the great thing about the rapid weight loss diet, the 100 calorie diet, is that's the first fat that goes. And what Professor Roy Taylor has done, he's seen hundreds of patients, he does MRI scans on them, and you can actually see the liver, the, the fat melt away from the liver over a period of just a couple of weeks. So average uh, fatty liver, fat in the liver drops from around 36% to 3%, and that happens within the first three or four weeks. So another good reason if you've got fatty liver disease, no drugs will do that. Nothing uh, drug-related will reverse fatty liver disease. This is the only thing that will do it. And that's why it is such an important message. And as I said, it's true of type 2 diabetes. But other reasons for doing this sort of rapid weight loss approach might be to you know, come off blood pressure tablets, uh, to come off uh, cholesterol drugs to come off, um, you know, to reduce your risk of dementia or reduce your risk of breast cancer, things like that. They are all tied in with excess fat around the gut. So, um, yeah, as you can see, those are the reasons why I am so passionate about it because the studies are out there, the information is sort of coming out there, the data is out there, it's just letting people know that they are not, you know, doomed to have to, you know, take drugs for the rest of their life. There are alternatives which are much more powerful, much more effective. And the great thing is that people are able to take control over their own lives, which, again, certainly in my, my wife's patients, they say that's one of the great things, the fact they feel so proud of themselves that they've managed to reverse all these dreadful diseases, and they've done it themselves. They haven't had to rely on medication to do it. Well, it certainly is a good news story. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking it's like back to the future. You know, intermittent fasting and fasting has always been a healing tool in, in um, you know, just 100 years ago in more naturopathic approaches to healing or the ancient cultures in Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. I mean, these these modalities have understood the role of fasting for health. And we are now rediscovering it again and and through the work you're doing understanding how powerful fasting is or at least restricting food for a period of time is critical for our body's ability to function 100 percent. and all the great religions have advocated some form of fasting hippocrates who's known as the father of modern medicine uh who is a, a genius greek doctor um three thousand years ago he advocated fasting. He said it was one of the best natural healers around. The philosopher Plato advocated it. Benjamin Franklin advocated it. And interestingly, there is um, a, a form of uh, intermittent, the type of intermittent fasting that I have been writing about and I also write about in the new book, there are different forms. So one of them, which is the one I call 5-2, you cut your calories two days a week. So it's not brutal. But you do need to have a, quite a you know, drop in the calories. And uh, as I said, it's around, I now recommend around 800 calories. So you go down to 800 calories two days a week. And if you do that, then you see slow and steady weight loss. Uh, but there's another approach which has um, become very fashionable recently, which is called time-restricted eating. Have you come across that one? Oh, yes, I do it myself. Absolutely. So you know about it, 16, 8, 14, 10, that sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, for your listeners who are less familiar with it, the idea here is that you want to extend your overnight fast. Um, so, for example, if you were to stop eating at 7 o'clock in the evening and not have a late night snack and then not eat again until, say, 9 o'clock the next morning, that would be a 14-hour period in which you are not putting calories into your system. And uh, then you eat within a 10-hour window after that. So you start eating at 9 in the morning and then you finish your meal at 7 in the evening. So that's 10 hours of eating, 14 hours of fasting. And uh, this is all based on the research of a guy called Professor Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute in California, 
I first came across them in 2013 when I was looking at different forms of intermittent fasting. But since then, it has really taken off in a massive way. Some people do what's called 16-8, uh, where they actually extend the overnight fast by 16 hours. Uh, but I've done some studies, and Professor Panda has done some studies, and we broadly conclude that 14 hours is pretty well optimal and sustainable. I don't know, what's your pattern of overnight fasting? Well, I, I basically eat within a uh, probably a six-hour window. Right, and, okay, and so you're all, doing sort of 18-6. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think when we're talking, oh, and, and we're going to kind of mention this, and then we can go into more depth on these things and the reasons why they're working, because I think people would really like to know that. But um, the other piece that I've been learning about, and uh, uh, I've been listening to some of Dr. Pandas as well, is the circadian component of yes. of eating. And um, having studied Chinese medicine, I've always known that your strongest digestive fire is mid-afternoon. And yes. if you eat late at night, then you have lost the ability to properly digest and assimilate and it can impair everything because you have food kind of sitting there. So can you talk a little bit about that component? And then we'll put it all together. Okay, sure. So um, one of the reasons uh, it is, from a scientific point of view, why it is a bad idea uh, to eat late at night is your body basically just isn't, doesn't want to digest late at night. We all have these internal clocks. You were talking about circadian rhythm. So you've got the, the main clock in your brain, uh, which is the central clock, uh, and which kind of drives some of the other clocks. But you've got a clock in your pancreas. You've got a clock in your liver. You've got a clock in your gut. All sorts of things. So um, I did an experiment a while ago in which I ate exactly the same meal, uh, quite a sort of fatty, carby meal at 10 in the morning or 10 in the night. And what I did is I measured my blood sugar levels, my blood fat levels, uh, for two hours after each of those meals. And when I had the meal at 10 o'clock in the morning, I could see my blood sugars went up, and then they came right down again. And that all happened within about a sort of hour and a half to two hours. When I ate exactly the same meal at 10 o'clock at night, my blood sugars and the fat levels in my blood went up, and they stayed up until two in the morning, four hours later. So my body was processing it completely differently in the morning and in the evening. And as you say, that is because your body really, really, uh, it's kind of a bit like the restaurant that is closed down for the night. It doesn't want to get into the whole messy process of cranking it up and uh, starting digestion going and things like that. So it, it really doesn't like being hit with a heavy meal late at night. And that's one of the unfortunate <coughs> trends is that we are, and I don't know about the U.S., but certainly in the U.K., we're eating later and later. People lead these horrible, busy lives. Uh, and so traditionally, people would have eaten about 6 to 7 o'clock at night. Now, most people are eating 8 to 9 o'clock at night. And then they have a snack just before they go to bed. And then they wake up. And within about 15 minutes of waking, uh, they're eating another meal. So we rarely uh, go more than about 10 or 11 hours without eating. And that seems to be a, a pretty bad idea. Oh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's it's so horrifying to think of eating a big meal at 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, there are cultures, when I lived in Malaysia, everybody came out and ate late at night. And even, yep. I think, you know, European cultures in, in Spain, Portugal, aren't they all late night eaters as well? Do they have this problem? Well, um, they have become that way in the last few generations. They weren't before. Um, places like Malaysia have unbelievably high rates of type 2 diabetes. And uh, when they, um, you, if you're in Malaysia, where once you saw quite slim people, now you see people with quite large pot bellies. Mm. Um, so they are not a great advert for late night eating. Uh, and to be fair, the same is true, unfortunately, in places like Greece. So the traditional Greek peasant, the Mediterranean diet, they would have eaten, you know, sun setting, they would have had their evening meal, uh, and then they would sort of, you know, do various activities, head to bed quite early, get up quite early, have a meal. Uh, and they certainly weren't partying until 11 o'clock at night. And so the modern Greeks are really quite fat. They're amongst the fattest people in Europe. Uh, and that's because they're no longer eating as their ancestors did or living as their ancestors did. Unfortunately, they are living and eating like Americans do. And uh, that has utterly undermined their health. So the, the wow. tragedy is that so many countries around the world have um, copied the American way of eating and living. 
and that has had um, very unfortunate consequences for their health. We have a lot to answer for, actually. I think so. Uh, Lots of good things as well, uh, but uh, unfortunately (laughs) a lot of bad things. You know, when you were talking about the in, in the UK, the National Health Service is really looking at promoting intermittent fasting and helping to reduce diabetes rates. I, I I don't ever see that happening in this country because the lobbies are just too strong from the pharmaceutical industries to have a national program that would cut yes, down. I think the it's going to be a challenge. What I'm hoping yeah. is that the evidence from the UK will be so strong because they are about to. And my approach, which is intermittent fasting, but also in the Fast 800 rapid weight loss, is the one that they are about to embrace with 5,000 people. They've already done it with about three or 400 people, and they've seen spectacular changes, spectacular weight loss. Uh, As I said, average weight loss on this diet has been in the order of 20 pounds in eight weeks. And the great thing is it's sustained because these people have been followed now for a couple of years. That's why the UK government is funding research and they're going to do 5,000 people. And indeed, there is another big trial in Australia, again, 5,000 people, uh, which is going to unpack soon doing rapid weight loss, fast 800 approach. And so I suspect at some point uh, the evidence will become so overwhelming uh, the, the Americans will sit up and listen. Also, the costs are so stupendous. So, you know, the cost of treating someone with type 2 diabetes in the U.S. is humongous. It costs around $250 billion a year. In the U.K., it costs around $600 a year to um, you know, maintain somebody who's got type 2 diabetes. You can get rid of that disease for less than $100. So when you start looking at the economics of it, you go, this is insane. The only people who are benefiting from it are the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and it's not even as though these drugs are particularly effective. Because even if you are on these medications, it doesn't stop the disease progressing because you're not actually treating the underlying disease. You're just treating the symptoms. So you're helping to reduce the blood sugar levels. My wife, for example, she sees, you know, pharmaceutical people all the time as a busy doctor. And they say, new wonder drug. What it'll enable you to do is to urinate out the sugar. And of course, you will then get things like infections of the bladder and things like that, but hey, that's the price to pay. And she says, but do they actually alter the outcomes like blindness, like dementia, like things like that? And they say, no, probably not, or at least we have no data to show they do. All we can say about our drugs is they create less side effects than the competitors. So I'm confident that at some point, it's a bit like smoking. Uh, It took forever to persuade people uh, that smoking was bad for you, and to actually change everything. But eventually it happened because the, the smoking lobby was so unbelievably powerful, they were able to create all these false, fake institutions, all this fake science. And that's what the food lobby is doing now. They create, they stir up all this dust, they show up all sorts of nonsense, they create lobbies which tell you that you know, consuming lots of sugar is fine, and it's all about exercise. It just isn't true. So I am beginning, I am feeling quite optimistic that the evidence will become so overwhelming with time uh, that the, um, yeah, that things will change. Well, we're going to talk about your new book, The Fast 800 Diet, but I just have to get this in, Michael. You have been such a force for good in this world, and it's, um, it's just so inspiring that you have been able to have such huge influence and come from a place of your true humanitarian nature and the the true Hippocratic oath of do no harm. I I just have to thank you for your dedication and commitment. Thank you very much. It's very generous of you to say that. Yes. No, it's it's wonderful. So let's let's get into the Fast 800 diet and um, explain to uh, my audience what that's about and how people can start doing it for themselves. Sure. So the 800 Um, is calories. So that sounds like a very low amount, 800 calories. And what I'm suggesting is there's a three-stage to this program. The first stage is 800 calories a day, every day, uh, for at least the first couple of weeks. Uh, I do have a website called thefast800.com, so you can go and check whether you're suitable, because it's not suitable for everyone, and to get a sort of feeling for it. But the reason for doing rapid weight loss, at least initially, is um, that it's very powerful. 
you will see if you have type 2 diabetes, if you have your own blood pressure tablets, things like that, you do need to kind of talk to your doctor because your blood pressure will come down very fast, your blood sugars will come down very fast, and you are in danger of over-medicating. So this is based on a lot of research now, but um, if you do it right, a rapid weight loss diet can be a very effective way of losing that gut fat, that visceral fat. And uh, do it for a few weeks, see how you get on. Some people continue for quite a while. Um, people have done it for 12 weeks if they have a lot of uh, fat they want to lose or if they, uh, you know, they really, really want to uh, reduce their blood sugar levels or whatever and things like that. So, as I said, they've done trials in uh, well over uh, 900 people, and we've been running a program which, as I said, is nearly 20,000 people. So I'm confident it's safe and very effective. That is stage one. Uh, when you've kind of begun to hit the level that you're comfortable with, uh, then you uh, go to eating 800 calories twice a week. So that's kind of 5-2. It's intermittent fasting. And uh, you do that, again, until you kind of hit your targets. And then uh, you move to what I call the way of life. And throughout all this, I'm going to encourage people to do time-restricted eating uh, because that will make it much more effective and it will also make it easier to do. So I'm going to ask you to restrict the hours within which you eat food and drink uh, things with calories in. So uh, initially, by starting doing what I call 12-12, and then moving to 14.10, and if you can bear it, doing 16.8. But 14.10 is a reasonable compromise. And do that sort of five days a week. And in the book, I go into in detail how to do these things, the science, and also there are lots of recipes. And while you're doing this, I also have incorporated uh, information on how to reduce stress and also how to increase activity. So we know these are the three pillars of a healthy light, eating the right food, being a good weight, uh, reducing your stress, and making sure that you are remaining active. So this is a book which addresses all these things, and uh, I think it, it's, it's been very, very popular in the UK and Australia, which is where it's been out, and um, now in the US. And as I said, the feedback has been fantastic, and what I'm really encouraged by is uh, the feedback from doctors has also been very, very good. So I go and talk regularly to doctors, and they have embraced it. A lot of doctors I know have lost a lot of weight doing it. So I did wonder whether there would be considerable skepticism, particularly about a rapid weight loss diet, because we're always told you've got to lose weight slowly and steadily. Uh, but I'm collaborating with uh, academics from Oxford University and from Cambridge University. So I have impeccable academic qualifications so people find it very difficult to argue with the evidence and so uh, as I said it's been fantastic and that's your strength because you are just revealing the research that's been going on justifying the programs that you've created so it, it is hard to challenge something like that you know um for for many years, if, if anyone talked about going on an 800 calorie a day program, the dietitians, the doctors would be screaming. <laughs> it's like in horror, right? That's like yes. that's that's like a, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. You'll starve yourself to death, and you know you'll you'll be malnourished. But um, that's not true, and especially in our cultures. Um, the uh, the restriction of calories and going down to 800 a day, which you could still, I mean, if you look at your You can your, eat decent um, food on that. Your recipes, you've just got to make yeah, sure beautiful. the quality of the food you're eating is good. Right. So to get a maximum bang for your calories, make sure it's nutrient-rich because you absolutely can't be eating 800 calories of chips or 800 <laughs> calories of pizza. That, I'm afraid, isn't going to work. You need... Uh, <laughs> nutrient-rich stuff, which is where all the recipes are, and they're broadly based around a Mediterranean-style diet with fermented foods as well. But as you know and I know, the Mediterranean-style diet, the old traditional proper one, was, you know, without doubt one of the healthiest diets on the planet. There's so much evidence for the benefits of it. A bit of olive oil, oily fish, plenty of uh, legumes, nuts, and things like that. Well, a little bit of, um, you know, uh, dark chocolate, uh, and, but you can also throw in the fermented foods which come more from sort of Chinese culture and things like that but it's the mixture that seems to be unbelievably beneficial and really tasty as well 
And you do have some great recipes and beautiful photos that really get you <laughs> mouth watering. Thank you. Uh, on 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 these, you know, um, programs and the the diet that is low calorie. Um, can we talk a little bit about why restricting food, why doing intermittent fasting, why that has had such a powerful impact on restoring health? What goes on in the body when you are reducing intake of food? Sure. So one of the things that happens, um, so imagine, for example, you're doing an overnight fast and you've stopped eating at 7 o'clock at night and you're not going to eat again until 9 or 10 the next uh, morning. So the first thing that happens in your body is your body kind of is like a hybrid car. It runs on a mixture of sugar and fat and it prefers sugar. So sugar is like money in your pocket, whereas the fat is more like money in the bank. And we actually have, most of us, enough fat stores to keep us going for the next six months. It's kind of how do we access that money, that fat. And so what happens uh, when you go to bed, uh, so you, you stop eating at seven, your body starts to burn up the sugar that's in your blood, and then it turns to the stored sugar in your muscles and your liver called glycogen. And it's really only about seven to eight, maybe nine hours after you stopped eating that it turns to the fat. And then you become a fat-burning machine. And then you really, really start to burn the fat, and that's a process called ketosis. So that's kind of, there are some parallels with the keto diet. And the other thing that happens uh, when you stop eating for a while is that, again, after about seven or eight hours, a process called autophagy takes place. Your body starts to do repairs. It can't do repairs and essential things while you're eating. So your gut is, for example, a bit like a, a motorway. Uh, uh, and you can't repair the motorway when cars are rushing up and down it. You've got to close the motorway off, you've got to stop the traffic going up and down it, and then you get the repairs going on. And your gut really needs uh, repair, because it gets a terrific pounding throughout the day. So that's one of the processes that goes on. Other forms of repair go on. Your body gets into this thing, it's a bit like spring cleaning, um, you're not having to do all the digesting of food and the things like that, so your body kind of gets rid of the old junky cells. And the great thing is that when you then start to eat again, say at 9 or 10 the next morning, the body then goes into the other building new cells, and so there is more space, uh, if you like, uh, because the old cells have been chucked out, the junky old furniture is gone, the rubbish is gone, and that makes way for new cells. And one of the things we know, a lot of chronic disease is about the accumulation of junk. And so that's one of the great things that intermittent fasting does, is it clears out the junk. And we have an abundance of data now suggesting this can be unbelievably effective way of reducing your risk of all sorts of chronic diseases, including things like dementia. So those are the two primary mechanisms by which intermittent fasting seems to work. Uh, you may know of others, and indeed there are other mechanisms, but those I see as the primary ones. Right. You know, when you st you have to give your body that chance to uh, clean house, and you can't yes. clean house if you're constantly stuffing it with food. It's in a it's in a digestive process. It's not in a detox phase. And um, absolutely, uh, you know, that, that's where the and it seems yeah. unbelievably obvious when it's put like that, and yet. Uh, we've been encouraged to kind of have endless small snacks. I mean, that's another thing that has been driving the obesity crisis is the idea that if you have lots of small meals, lots of snacks, never get hungry, keep your blood sugars up, that's somehow a good thing. I mean, that turned out to be the worst possible advice because we evolved, you know. Our remote ancestors didn't eat five meals a day. Uh, they had long periods of feast and famine. And our bodies, as I said, are kind of designed... Uh, to have to cope with that, and that's kind of how we came to be such a successful species. And now we're undermining all that good uh, by, as I said, constantly eating, and that really is a bad idea. Yeah, and especially, you know, we're constantly eating toxic food. It might be a different story if we were eating the same amounts, but of organic foods and, and high, high quality foods. Uh, I don't know. We don't know because we're not in that place, but it's it's because we're eating so much of foods, well, you know, using that term loosely, of course, that, that has so much toxicity, chemicals, processed artificial ingredients that uh, is absolutely seen as toxins by the body. 
Absolutely. And the other thing, and as I said, also toxic for your microbiome, your gut bacteria. And again, one of the things we know is that having a diverse microbiome is really good for you. It's a bit like rainforest. You know, what you want is a wide range of species down there. And we know that a lot of the um, ingredients in fast food are absolutely toxic for your gut bacteria. And the other thing we know is that, as I said, a lot of these foods that have been created by the food industry are unbelievably addictive. So you go on eating them well beyond the point that you would otherwise stop. And the great thing about natural food, you know, you're eating broccoli, whatever it might be, you're not going to eat a huge amount of it uh, because you're going to stop. Your body signals will tell you, I'm full, I don't need any more. Whereas if you're eating chocolate, you're eating chips, you're eating pepperoni pizza, you can just go on sticking that stuff into your face and uh, I'll just have another biscuit, I'll have another. And I know that when I start on a large bar of chocolate, I will not stop. I'll have a little bit, then I'll have another little bit, then I'll have another little bit, you know. And so, uh, you know, I have to stick it in the bin. I don't have that problem with dark chocolate, but I do have that problem with milk chocolate. And uh, again, in the Fast 800, I have a section there. There's a thing called the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And uh, you can go there and uh, find out which foods you're addicted to. And uh, what do you think is the most addictive foods, uh, certainly based on the American population? It'd have to be something with sugar in it. Yep. Top of the list, chocolate. Hmm. Followed shortly yeah, afterwards milk chocolate. by milk pizza chocolate. and then yeah. uh, chips. So it's yeah. milk chocolate, yeah. And uh, it shares many of the same characteristics uh, as highly addictive things like heroin or, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, the people, they kind of wreck their health. Uh, and they know it's bad for them, but they just keep going. Right at the bottom of the Yale food addiction scale are things like broccoli and cabbage and things like that. Because uh, unfortunately, although they're really good for you, uh, they're not desperately addicted. Most people can kind of take them or leave them. So that's the thing is these foods have been engineered. That beautiful combination of fat and sugar. It's the ratio of the fat to the sugar which turns out to be absolutely critical. It's not just the sugar alone. So that, for example, uh, I am not going to eat a bowl of sugar by itself. But if you kind of mix it up with cream, add some vanilla, stick it in the freezer, pull it out, you've got ice cream, uh, vanilla <laughs> ice cream, and you can drink, eat tons of that stuff. So it's kind of the magic ratios that these people, have, these engineers have created, which is what makes these foods so addictive. <laughs> okay, so I want to, uh, before we uh, complete our, our, our wonderful conversation, uh, let's talk about exercise and what you have found, and do you, if you're still recommending what you did when you talked about um, the, the type of the, um, fast exercise to help us. When we do this sure. program, so you do the Fast 800 program, what What's, what have you found to be effective in terms of forms and kinds of exercise? Sure. I mean, broadly, there are three types of exercise you should be doing if you want to have optimal health. The first is aerobic exercise. That is running, walking, swimming, and things like that, cycling. Cycling is a particularly good form of exercise as you get older because you're not going to damage yourself. There is always a danger if you run, particularly if you sprint, uh, that you'll um, damage your Achilles or do things. I speak having recently ruptured my Achilles tendon. Well, that's sprinting. Uh, so there's aerobic exercise, then there is strength exercises, you've got to preserve your muscle, that means doing squats, resistance exercise, squats, press ups and things like that. And you don't have to do start, you can start with low numbers but kind of build it up. And the third type of exercise if you like is flexibility and that is the ability is balanced, flexible and that's what you get from doing things like yoga, uh, but Pilates, but I go into that and all three of these are super uh, important as you get older. Now, the thing I would say about say, aerobic exercise, if you're a walker, then what you're going to do is try and hit brisk walking because the benefits are much greater. There's the legendary 10,000 steps, and I've done quite a few studies now where we've shown it's not really about the number of steps you do, but the briskness with which you do that. So you're, you're better off doing three brisk 10 minute, 10 minute walks a day uh, than sort of meandering around for 10,000 steps. And uh, you need to be doing about 100 steps a minute. So get the right music. Uh, you can go to things like Spotify or whatever, and they will tell you how many beats a minute. Dancing Queen is a very good bit of music to uh, move along to. Uh, so you're trying to hit about 100 beats a minute if you are walking. 
uh, and around 160 if you're running. So music is a great way of motivating yourself, to, but even better if you can do it with a friend because one of the themes of the book, and it's certainly true of the online course we run, uh, is uh, support of the community is hugely important if you want to make change. If you want to lose weight, you want to keep the weight off, you want to do the exercise, uh, and you want to reduce your stress, then a community is really important. And uh, at my website, thefastdayandroid.com, uh, we have a big um, community who support other people because what they want to do is people who've changed their lives want to share it with other people. People are really, that's the great thing I've discovered, people are really generous. They want to share, they've been through it, they know how tough it can be, and they know what a big change it has made to their life and their health and they want to share it with other people. And I just love that. I love the fact that there are communities being built up. And uh, I do think in the end that's going to be one of the things that's also going to, going to push governments into change and things like that is the power of you know, online communities uh, who just know that this is the best way to go. So, to, uh, so the website again is thefast800.com. So that's if right. people want to join the community, um, how do they do that? Well, go along to the website, check in, uh, and uh, find out more there. Uh, most of the information is there. If you've got any questions, there are quite a lot of doctors and things like that also on the website, um, or let me know, or if you've got questions, let me know, and you can share you know, your listeners with me, and I can sort of feed back to you. I'm very passionate about reaching out. And I'd love to see more Americans on the site, so that would be great. Lots of Australians there, lots of uh, UK, British there. Uh, so I'm hoping to build up a good American contingent. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure you will, and that's what the show is all about. So before we conclude our conversation, can we just kind of recap what are the steps that sure. you have put into into writing and into practice and what will be recommended by the UK government to help with this weight um this this epidemic of obesity sure. and support weight loss. Let's so the initial thing is rapid weight loss 800 calories you can do that for up to 12 weeks you may do it for less time um average weight loss doing that approach in the first 8 weeks is around 20 pounds and over 12 weeks is 30 pounds. Um, and uh, it seems to be mainly fat, and uh, there are surprisingly few side effects, and people, the great thing is people say they stop feeling hungry after about the first three or four days, which is great, but drink lots and lots of fluid while you're doing it, lots of water, otherwise you're at risk of constipation and also headaches. So the rapid weight loss is first, then you move over to what I call the 5-2, where you do the 800 calories two days a week and eat healthily the other five days, and then the third stage is the way of life, where you kind of keep an eye on your weight, uh, but broadly speaking, you need to be eating healthy foods, foods you cook yourself, broadly a Mediterranean-style diet, and you're also incorporating more uh, activity into your life and also some of the stress-reducing programs uh, which are in the book and which are based on research done at Oxford University and amongst the professors I have been collaborating with there. So um, the uh, so the rapid weight loss and it, that should be done ideally within a what eight hour window so we yes get an eight to a ten hour window so if you can if yeah. you can incorporate time restricted eating into it as well and I do have an entire chapter dedicated to the research around there and how to do it uh, then that seems to be a much it makes the whole thing easier the thing I'd say about time restricted eating is that alone. It's not a great way of losing weight, although it gives you other benefits. But if you uh, include it with rapid weight loss, then it seems to make the rapid weight loss easier and also adds other benefits. So the two together seem to be much more effective than either alone. And I want to say, having done a similar program for myself, when you do this, you actually lose cravings. Yes. So it gets easier to do the more you stay with it. 100%. And that, again, is what surprises people. I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people write to me and say, I am amazed. I had these mad sugar cravings or whatever it might be, and within you know, a short period, they had gone. Your body is resetting itself, and your cravings and your brain, they're all resetting it. And so that's kind of what's brilliant about it. 
Well, it is because the more you do it, the the easier it gets, and and because you have such rapid fat loss, as I like to say, to make a distinction yeah. between muscle mass, right? Because you have such rapid fat loss, you're rewarded. You know, there's that that satisfaction. You see results happening very quickly, and the traditional way of dieting is slow and long and laborious, and you don't see many results at all. So you get discouraged and you want to quit. 100%. And so we know from the research now that uh, the amount of weight you lose in the first four to five weeks on this diet predicts uh, how much you will uh, lose and keep off at one year and two years. Um, so as you say, the psychological impact is enormous. The physiological impact is also huge because, as you were also saying, your hunger goes, your cravings go, so you find it much easier to stick to it. And ideally, you do it with your partner because one of the things we know is that when you do it with someone else, you're much more likely to stick to it. And so if you can get your partner on board, we've had many, many successful couples doing it together. And, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's great. Well, uh, thank you so much. We've come to the end of this uh, show, and it's always inspiring. Michael, I thank you again for the wonderful work you're doing. So people, go to thefast800.com, thefast800.com, learn more about the program, pick up uh, Dr. Michael Mosley's book, The Fast 800 Diet, Discover the Ideal Fasting Formula to Shed Pounds, Fight Disease, and Boost Your Overall Health. And our health is our wealth. So this is such a wonderful strategy plan to really get you on track for 2020. Dr. Michael Mosley, thank you so much for your time today and for your dedication to support all of us in living the healthiest life possible. Thank you. And to all of you listening, thank you for joining me today. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman. You're listening to What Women Must Know. And remember, always honor the wisdom of your feminine self. Bye for now. 